Okay, Dale Little here with Rescue American Ministries and uh, from my studio. And uh, those of you who have watched me before um, noted that I've said that my studio happens to be wherever I'm at, whenever I need to make a uh, <clears throat> program. Um, and this is something that's been, like Jeremiah said, um, that um, God's Word burned in his heart, in his bones, and he couldn't keep from speaking what thus saith the Lord. And um, this message has been on my heart the same way for the last couple of days. And so I decided I better get it done. Um, I've got some promises. Uh, those of you, there's plenty of you out there that what you like to do is take this book. And uh, you see, I've made uh, me a homemade cover on it. Uh, this uh, didn't have a very good cover when I ordered it, so I made my own. And instead of putting the Holy Bible on it, I put God's Word, which is the Holy Bible. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> I wanted to bring you right from this Word. A lot of you like to take this. You don't, you don't like to read it because it's got so much and it's difficult to read. Oh, my. But what you like to do is take it and, and go through it and pick out the little nuggets here and there. Uh, you know, it's kind of like a buffet when you go to a nice place to eat and, and they've got a real nice buffet there and you, you just go down the table and you pick out what you want the best and you leave the rest lying. Friend, that is not what this book is. That's not what this book was intended for. This book was intended as if you were eating in a fine restaurant where you're served the whole meal. And you're pretty much expected to eat what's on your plate, what you're served. Yeah, this is a lot to digest. You can't do it in one sit down. But it all needs to be digested. It's not, it is not a buffet that you just pick and choose what you like out of it and leave the rest sitting there. That is an affront to God Almighty who preserved this word for you that you would have it. And we would have it as a people in our day preserved you know, we might find salvation, salvation in it. And that others might find salvation in it. But no, we want to pick it. This sounds good. I like this promise. I'm going to claim this promise. Shame on you. Yeah, I said it right. Shame on you. If that's all the reverence you have for this book, shame on you. God is not pleased. Let me, let, me, let me show you what you're doing here. And this is rampant. This is not one or two people. This is rampant across our country, our nation, and going around the world. Just take out the good parts that you like. And just, you know, don't, don't worry about the rest of it. That's what you do. And there's some, I hate to do this, but I don't know any other way around it. Just go ahead and say it like it is. I, I read a lot of um, things that are put up by many, many different people. And there's some good um, posts out there on social media. Um, forward scriptures and things and uh, but what I see more than anything else is is these they're false promises and they're supposedly made by God but they weren't really um, and we ignore so much of it and, and it seems like everybody's getting in on that some of the people that I have, teachers that I've respected in the past, 
are now going to, and that's about all you see is the, oh, the things that make people feel good. Kind of like Joel Osteen. He will stand before God. Joel Osteen, you will stand before God. Oh, you, you, yeah, I've heard you. I've heard you talk. I've heard you answer questions. I've heard you preach. And, and that's, you're doing what you love to, to give people to feel good. Because you like to make people feel good because it makes you feel good. Right? Yes, that's right. You don't preach the whole word of God because you don't like to preach the part that might make you feel bad and might make someone else feel bad. You don't want anybody to feel guilty of their sin. You'd rather they go to hell believing in you and your teaching and your promises. That's all you care about. And there's many, many others just like you. They pass this stuff along and these false promises that do not belong to you or those that uh, many people that claim them. Let me take a couple examples I've got here right here. And let me explain what you need to do. Right here is I, I've got a wonderful promise for you right here. Right out of the word of God. Just told on here. This is wonderful. Now if you, you know, if you say you can take any promise out of the word of God and make it your own. You just have to claim it. Right here we go. You can't treat part of them one way and part the other way. You can't say, well, I can't claim this and I can't claim. If I can claim this one, it's not really directed to me, then I can claim all of them. Well, actually, you need to claim all of them. If one is meant for you, it's not directed toward you, then all of them are. You can't just say this about one and, and well, this one, this one don't apply to me because I don't like it. Well, here's your wonderful promise. In 1 Kings, chapter 21, this is after uh, this mighty king Ahab had pitched a pity party because Naboth had a vineyard that's much better than his. And he wanted it, but uh, Naboth wouldn't sell it to him, and he whined about it until Jezebel arranged to get Naboth taken care of. So in verse 13, it says, And there came two, two men, children of Belial, and sat before him. Um, they put Naboth on trial. Uh, and the men of Belial, Belial, Satan, witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. And so Ahab got Naboth's vineyard. Just like that. Jump on down to verse 17, same chapter, 21 of 1 Kings. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord. This promise is for you. You that like to take promises out of the Bible and make them your own, this promise is for you. And thou shalt speak unto him, thus, saying, Thus saith the Lord, hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. Oh, you don't like that promise? What's wrong with it? It's right here in the Word of God. Oh, you haven't done anything like that? Oh, you've sinned against God. You, you, you've taken his word and you've omitted in all your 
Things that come out of your mouth, out of your fingers as you type. You've omitted anything negative out of the Word of God, and all you give people is the honey. Everything's okay. Oh, God's not going to judge you. Oh, don't pay attention to that stuff. Just, uh, some even go so far as to say, just proclaim it. Not so. Just proclaim this as being so, if you like it. Just proclaim it. You're liars. Nowhere does the Word of God teach that. Why don't you pro proclaim the whole Word of God? You've misrepresented. You've handled this Word carelessly, and you've mishandled it. As if anybody is qualified to just open it up and begin to teach and to preach. The Bible says that he that teaches will be held to a higher accountability. You better think about that. You say, well, I just pass stuff along and I see other people. Yeah, very carefully you pass things along that, oh, just be encouraged, everything's okay. You very conveniently don't pass along anything that requires any responsibility of anybody. So whether you pass it along or whether you initiate the writing, doesn't matter. You're part of it. You need to be more careful. And then you go on down. Thanks to verse 23. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. There's another good promise. Promises for you that like to take the promises out of the word of God and make them your own. Hey, you can't just take some of them and, and leave the rest of them. If you say they're all applied to you, regardless who they're getting made to, then all apply to you, including this one. I, you better start taking this serious. You don't need to take me serious, but you better take this word serious. Here's another one. Here's the type of thing that people like to put out there. Uh, Joel, the book of Joel is misrepresented. Uh, just twisted. People take that and, and misuse it. Let's go to Isaiah 54. And people like to lay claim to this particular verse, even though it's not addressed to us. Now, you know, I, I do understand that there's a few. Um, I differ with a few people on this, some of these. This is not one of them, though. Uh, well, I mean, I do differ on, depending on which side you're on here. But what I'm saying is that for example, over in Revelation chapter 3, uh, talking about the church of Laodicea, God says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You know, he made an open door. You know, well, I'll uh, come in. I'll come in and sup with him and uh, and, and he with me and, and on and on. And so um, I've heard some preachers say, well, you, you know, that doesn't apply to us. I can't use that as an invitation because that's speaking specifically to the church at Laodicea. But no, that that is different because God so used the words and, and I believe in the verbal inspiration of the word of God. Each word has a meaning to it, not just a thought. And Jesus, in that specifically said, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. So that makes it available to you and me or anyone else that we want to present the gospel to. God is knocking at your door. Yes, that verse applies because if you have ears to hear, yes, he said it to the churches, but let everybody hear what, let everybody hear what God said to the churches. That's what he's saying. But this is not so. Listen to this. Verse 17 of chapter 54 of Isaiah. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. 
and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and the righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Okay, a lot of you want to say, well, that's a promise from God to you, even though you're a Gentile. Well, let's go back. Let's read the context here. That's what you don't like to do, I know. Start in verse 3. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed. Now that word, same text there about not being ashamed is used over in Joel. And that's key there also. So wait a minute here. This is talking to who? Let's back up to verse 1. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing, and cry aloud, thou didst not travail a child for more. Are the children of the desolate, the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent. Let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords and strengthening thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth. He's talking here to the children of Israel. Thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles. If you're a Gentile, this is not for you. This is against you. No weapon that you may form against the Jewish nation will prosper. That's what it's saying exactly what it's saying. And then it talks about not being put to shame. Uh, I wasn't going to go here, but let me go on over to the book of Joel right quick. Um, okay, well, let me finish here first, one thing at a time. Go on down to 14. In righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear from terror, for it shall not come near thee. Well, this was written thousands of years ago. How can God say such a thing? Look at all that's happened to Israel. Thou shalt be far from oppression? Antiochus Epiphanes came along after that, slaughtered millions of Jews. And then Adolf Hitler, and just in the last century, slaughtered millions and millions of Jewish people. I, I mean, did God lie? No, he didn't, because this is a future. This is a prophecy. It's telling of the future. In righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression. He's not saying you are now. But the day will come. And go back to verse 3. It says that same thing. It's prophetic. It has not come about yet. And it will not come about until when. The key is right here in the verse. For fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed. Stop, stop and think. Use your head up here. Can Israel honestly say that they're not ashamed as long as they reject Jesus Christ as the Messiah? They live with that shame. Yes, he has not written off Israel. We're to love Israel. We're to support Israel. But they still live with the shame of rejecting Jesus Christ and crucifying him on a cross. Of course, you know, we don't need to point the finger at them. That's not that we've been guilty of doing that any more than we do us because he died for our sins. We put him on the cross also. But physically, the Jewish nation put him on the cross. 
They did not want him at that time. But the day will come that they will no longer be ashamed when they finally see him and accept him as their Messiah. That's when these promises come into effect. That's when no weapon that is formed against Israel shall prosper. Until then, they're still subject to read Zechariah. One third of the nation will be cut off. One third of the nation. No, excuse me. Two thirds will be slaughtered. You carried off captive. That only leaves one third. But that one-third that's left will finally recognize Jesus Christ as their Messiah. In those last days, that's when this is talking about. So if this promise, you want to take this promise and claim it when it's out of character, it's not really meant for you. If you say it is, well, I still say that that meant for me. Well, so is the one that we just read back over here about Ahab and Jezebel. You have to take you have to take those promises too. They're the same same way. You can't just pick part of them and, and pick them out of context and not take all of them. I'm gonna tell you, God may not do things just like I said read here. But you're toying. You're playing around with the word of God. God is not pleased with it. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your name is. Um, Joel Osteen. Some of the big names that we hear today. Uh, people, some of them not even respect otherwise. And respected through the years of the things that they've accomplished. And yet they've gone this route. I've seen a uh, post by... Um, um, oh, I can't even think of his name right now. Um, David Wilkerson. Uh, I see many of his posts that are lean towards this narrative of picking promises out of context. They're just not there. I'm sorry. I, I, I can't help it. I can't help how big a name they've got. I'm going to preach the Word of God. I'm going to teach the Word of God just as it says here, and just as God gives it. I I don't understand why they don't stand. Uh, how they've... I know it gets tiresome. I, I get tired of having to preach this type of thing. God's judgment. But God's judgment needs to be talked about. God's judgment is real, and it's upon us today. And it's upon us in large part because of the church and how we treat the Word of God. I wish I could just preach all this. Oh, well, I, yeah, I could be sitting pretty and maybe even, if I was good enough at it, a pretty good income coming in. Uh just making people feel good. Just, hey, look at this promise. Oh, nothing bad ever going to happen to you. Everything's going to be roses. Well, God hadn't promised that. I'm sorry. We're under the judgment of God. It's not because. In other words, it's not just because of the abortionists. It's not just because of the pedophiles. It's not just because of all these other wicked people. It's because of you and I in the church that treat God's word frivolously. We don't take it serious. Well, I, I like this part. I like, yeah, this, this part. I, I, you may as well just take, you, you never look at them. You never read them. You might as well just take the pages, tear them out, burn them. For, for all the good that they do you. Because most of you never read it. I mean, 
and I don't brag about this. I, I do mention it quite often, but it's not a, a brag. Uh, I've read through this book 20 some times from Genesis to Revelation. 75 years old, I should have done it probably 50 times by now. But there's a number of years that I'd cast it aside. Thank God, God wouldn't let me leave it laying. And he drew me back in and I picked it up because I belong to him. It's dear to me, the whole thing. I talked to a man here not too long ago that uh, last few years that he was reading through it for the 100th time. That puts me to shame. <laughs> so that's why I say I'm not bragging on my 20 something. But I'm telling you, that's what God has left it here for. That's God. Men have died to make sure that we had copies of this book. And you treat it with such frivolousness that you just want this little bit and that little bit. Shame on you. Again, shame on you. We need to repent of how we've treated God and how we've treated his word. Let's go look at Joel right quick. I went further enough. Longer than I went to go on this, but Joel's very important. We do the same thing over there. We turn it upside down, twist it, try to get something completely opposite from what God is saying in it. Joel is also a prophetic book. And yes, there was there was some completion. Well, I mean, that's I say completion. That's an oxymoron there. It's, uh, but there was some fulfillment to some extent. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached, it said, you know, people, um, Peter said, you know, this is as the, the days of Joel. Um, the, the days of Joel it talked about. But that was not the complete completion of it. If anything, that was just the beginning of, And it remains to be seen what Joel prophesied about. It's a very short book, so it's, I'm, I'm flipping pages right through, past it. Have patience with me. There it was, and then it's gone. Okay, here we go. Joel. Yeah, yeah, these promises. You've heard them. You've heard these promises. People make them to you, probably. I've had them make them to me. They're lies when twisted out of context. It makes God sound like a liar. Verse 23 of chapter uh, 2. We'll start there. Be glad then, you children of Zion. Uh, are you a child of Zion? No, no, I'm afraid you're not. Well, you're grafted in, you say. Well, that's not who he's talking about here. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. Well, what first month? All of this is prophetic. All of this is yet to come. I hear people today still talking about they're looking forward to this latter rain. They think they're going to live to see it. No, you're not. No, I'm not saying we won't see some revivals. But not this latter rain that it talks about where the blessing comes down and and uh, rejuvenates and, and replenishes. And this is, they talk about a spiritual revival. There's not going to be a great worldwide spiritual revival 
Some people think that that's what's going to happen, and and we're going to have the church is going to have the, the uh, world ready for Jesus Christ to come and take over for His millennial kingdom. No, 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 no. God will do that Himself. Jesus will do that Himself. He will come back in the clouds riding on a white horse with a two-edged sword, and He will slay those armies that are here coming against his people. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says, according to Jesus Christ in chapter 23 of Matthew, that the days will get worse and worse, as in the days of Noah. So you're looking for things and, and uh, to get better and better. And there again, I'm not saying that there can't still be Places of revival, even for our nation. But, but no, it's it's not going to be such that it's going to change the whole world, turn the world into a good place. John chapter 3 is still true and will still be true until Jesus Christ comes back and sets up his millennial kingdom. That is the light shining in darkness. Darkness, darkness comprehended it not. The darkness hates the light. That's what it says. Luke verse 25 here. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the plum worm, my great army which I sent among you. <laughs> You've never been... <laughs> You never had the caker worms and the palm worms and the locusts come destroy your stuff. Oh, you may have lost some things through your own sin, through your own carelessness. Oh, you may have been robbed even maybe, but there wasn't any canker worms and caterpillars, and things like that, the locusts. Nonsense. But it did here in Joel. It happened to the kid, the children of Israel. And God said, I'll restore all those things. God, whatever you've lost, God's not promised he's going to restore it to you in this life. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. If you laid it up down here and the... the, the <laughs> If you laid your treasures up down here and, and the locusts ate it and, and everything else and the thieves got it, that wasn't God's fault. That was your fault for laying your treasures up down here. When he said, lay them up, store them up in heaven. Where moth and rust cannot corrupt. And thieves cannot get to it. What do you think? God's going to restore. You have treasure in heaven for what you've done down here, or your rewards. Now, we don't get to heaven based on our works, but God will reward us. Our rewards come from our works. There's a difference. And it says in the latter part of verse 26, and my people shall never be ashamed. Again, I go back. I listened to a man preach, preach this the other day. I don't say where or whatever, but, oh, he mistwisted it. And it was, man, good. He's trying to encourage people. But it's just wrong. Again, it makes God sound like a liar. And my people shall never be ashamed. And that's what he was telling his audience there, that uh, you'll never be ashamed. You'll never need to be ashamed. Well, uh, I promise you that many of those that left out of that day will. The day will come when they will be ashamed. They'll not make it because they haven't put their whole trust in Jesus Christ like they should. And uh, for one reason or another, they're not going to make it. They will be ashamed. That makes God sound like a liar when you tell people that. And you make all these other promises. No weapon shall be formed against you. What happened to all these people just a few years ago in the Middle East when the uh, ISIS was on the move, when they were on the rise, taking people out every day, taking Christians out, 
cutting their heads off and making it, putting it public on film, videoing it. Tell them that no weapon formed against them will prosper. That makes God sound like a liar because the world knows what happened. Can you, well, how about I explain that? Yeah, you can hee-haw around, blah, blah, blah. well, yeah, yeah uh, uh, uh. no, the truth is that it, that is yet prophetic. God has not promised you that no weapon will ever prosper against you. God has not promised me that no weapon will ever prosper against me. He has not made that promise. He made it to his children of Israel. And it is yet future. I mean, we want heaven on earth here now. Well, it's not. It is not that is yet to come in the future. Read your Bible. Then you play games if you want to. Then you play around with this word if you want to. And this country continues to sink deeper and deeper and deeper. Dale Little, Rescue America Ministries.